Well behind England. The public have watched every day for months Scotland governing itself, its devolved powers never more visible. It remains my intention to have UK-wide alignment where the evidence supports it, uh, though obviously my overarching responsibility is to reach evidence-based decisions that are right for Scotland. Several polls since the start of the year suggest a majority of people in Scotland now support independence. The latest suggests 55% of Scots are planning to vote for the SNP at next year's Holyrood election. If that's accurate, it would create another pro-independence majority in the Scottish Parliament. For both sides, this is a sit-up-and-pay-attention moment. But what's driving this growing support? Intriguingly, this isn't just a case of those people who are already committed to independence, those who are already backing the SNP, saying that Nicola's done well and Boris is uh, not done so well. But even amongst those who voted no, those who voted leave, Nicola Sturgeon emerges as having thought to have uh, handled uh, coronavirus better than Boris Johnson. This latest poll comes weeks after the two governments began to diverge in the policies they adopted to ease lockdown. So perhaps more telling is a poll that was taken six weeks ago, in May, when the governments were still moving in lockstep, when the policies were the same and the mistakes being made on PPE, on testing, on care homes, were very similar north and south of the border. In that poll, 30% said they thought Boris Johnson was handling the crisis well, and 82% said they thought Nicola Sturgeon was handling it well. Why the gap, since the policies and the mistakes were the same? What it boils down to is public trust in the clarity and credibility of what each of the two governments was saying. Scotland's coronavirus numbers have been driven right down. Daily new cases are in single figures, six today, seven yesterday. It has its own test and trace system. It has come out of lockdown much more gradually. It has chosen its own path. And eliminating the virus over the summer is now a realistic aim. What lies behind that achievement? So the first thing is, I think we were later in the curve. So in terms of how the virus entered the borders in the UK, we know London was hard hit at the beginning, and we know that Scotland was probably around a week potentially more behind that. And then I think the government or the public health response here has also contributed. Um, so we've had um, a number of mistakes that have been made, but I think, think things like track and trace and also clear messaging from uh, the government and a lot of trust in the government have probably contributed. Nicola Sturgeon has been the consistent face of the public response. She has fronted all but two of the daily briefings since March. Despite early mistakes, even her critics have been struck by her clarity and her capacity for straight talking. I think it's certainly true that the tone of the Scottish Government and of Nicola Sturgeon in particular during the course of the coronavirus outbreak has been markedly different from that of the UK Government. But certainly Nicola Sturgeon has seemingly, most of the time at least, seemingly talking to people on the level saying look this is difficult um, I'm going to worry about some of the decisions I made maybe for the rest of my life Nicola Sturgeon may have led on public health but the Scottish government has no borrowing powers we cannot lose this generation so today I'm announcing the kickstart scheme only the UK Treasury has the legal power to borrow the vast sums needed to fund its economic intervention. The Conservatives here are putting their faith in this, that the independence tide will recede again when the UK government starts leading the country back to economic health. The second half of, I think, this emergency is the economic emergency, the economic challenge. I think that the announcements that we've just seen, which are not so much about managing ourselves through the pandemic itself, but managing our way out of it. I mean, we absolutely have to now recognise that a debate in our constitutional future isn't going to secure Scotland's economy, its jobs or its businesses in the period ahead, uh, nor would a Scottish government, I think, acting alone secure that. And it's there that I think that the broad shoulders of Great Britain really stand out and people will see again just how important that is fundamentally uh, to, the, you know, to the, the character of life in Scotland. I've been watching the Scottish independence movement for 40 years. I cast my first vote as a teenager in the devolution referendum of 1979. And it seems to me one thing has remained constant through all those decades, and it's this. 
that support for devolution and now independence builds when there's a perception that Westminster's imposing on Scotland policies that were rejected at the ballot box here, when the popular legitimacy of Westminster rule can be called into question. One day the pandemic and this strange way of living will be over, but Brexit will still be with us, and Scotland voted decisively against it. If, as polls suggest, the SNP win a majority at Holyrood next year, will that be enough to force Boris Johnson to grant a second referendum? Nicola Sturgeon insists the UK government would not be able to disregard a clear electoral mandate. Well, I mean, what she would say is that, that a British government could not stand out uh, eventually against a, an overwhelming mandate for a second referendum. Now, I suppose Boris might say, well, no, you need another, you need another um, election. I mean, he, he could try and string it out. But, but Nicola's plan is to wear him down. Is this spike in support for independence solely down to the pandemic, or is it just the latest chapter in a long, slowly unwinding story that stretches back decades? I hear today the echo of an earlier chapter in that story. In the 1980s, Scotland did not want to walk the path mapped out by Margaret Thatcher, but as part of the United Kingdom, it had to. That experience transformed the way Scotland thought about its place in the Union and created a three-to-one solid majority in favour of creating the Scottish Parliament. And this is what makes today a sit-up-and-pay-attention moment for anyone who supports the Union. Are we now in a similar place? For Scotland doesn't want to walk the Brexit path either, but will have to as part of the United Kingdom. The question is whether that has a similarly transformative effect on the way Scotland thinks about independence.